This morning we're going to read Psalm 104, which is a cosmic hymn of praise. If Genesis tells us the creation story, then Psalm 104 takes the words of Genesis and puts it to music, turning it into a ballad. Now this psalm doesn't often get preached, probably because when it shows up in the lectionary, it shows up as the psalm for Pentecost each year, and so it gets overlooked in favor of the Pentecost narrative. And when it does show up, it gets dismembered. The lectionary slices and dices it into a 10-verse chunk, and that works with some psalms, but unfortunately it doesn't do this psalm any favors, because usually when we try to slice it into a shorter chunk, it begins at a section that says, how manifold are your works? And that's really confusing if you don't know what works the psalmist is talking about. And so this morning, we're going to read the whole psalm and hear the psalmist's account of creation, because I think that God's word for us today is found not in what the psalmist tells us that God created, but how the psalmist tells us God created. And this is one of those days that I give thanks for this sanctuary with clear windows, as Emily pointed out. There is great wisdom in being able to see straight out to God's good creation when we worship. And so I'm going to pray, but as I read the psalm, I invite you to stare outside at God's creation and see how it might be speaking to you this morning. Let's pray. Be with us, God. Breathe your spirit into this place and into these words, just as you breathed your spirit at the start of creation. With your breath, animate us. Give us eyes to see your vision, ears to hear your word, and lungs to breathe your joy. Amen. Hear now this psalm and what the Spirit is saying to her church this morning. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O my Lord, you are very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty, wrapped in light as with a garment. You stretch out the heavens like a tent. You set the beams of your chambers on the waters. You make the clouds your chariot. You ride on the winds of the wind, the wings of the wind. You make the wind your messengers, fire and flame your ministers. You set the earth on its foundation so that it shall never be shaken. You cover it with the deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. At your rebuke, they flee. At the sound of your thunder, they take to flight. They rose up to the mountains, ran down to the valleys, to the place that you appointed for them. You set a boundary that they may not pass, so that they might not again cover the earth. You make springs gush forth in the valleys. They flow between the hills, giving drink to every wild animal. The wild asses quench their thirst. By the streams, the birds of the air have their habitation. They sing among the branches. From your lofty abode, you water the mountains. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your work. You cause the grass to grow for the cattle and plants for people to cultivate, to bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the human heart, oil to make the face shine and bread to strengthen the human heart. The trees of the field are watered abundantly, the cedars of Lebanon that he planted. In them the birds build their nests. The stork has its home in the fir trees. The high mountains are for the wild goats. The rocks are a refuge for the conies. You have made the moon to mark the seasons. The sun knows it's time for setting. You make darkness and it is night when all the animals of the forest come creeping out. The young lions roar for their prey, seeking their food from God. When the sun rises, they withdraw and lie down in their dens. People go out to their work and to their labor until the evening. O oh Lord, how manifold are your works! In wisdom, you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. There is the sea, great and wide. Creeping things innumerable are there. Living things, both small and great. There go the ships that Leviathan 
that you formed a sport in it. These all look to you to give them their food in due season. When you give to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works, who looks on the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have been. May my meditation be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. Let sinners be consumed from the earth, and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. How to feel small. Stare out at the ocean. Look up at the stars. Realize that you are part of something much bigger and much more important than you. This was the start to an actual article that ran a couple years ago in the New York Times. It shared the benefits of so-called shrinking yourself and being odd. When you do this, it said, you can reduce your sense of entitlement, feel more connected to others, and realize that you're just a puny part of something whole and unfathomable, and that's enough. Spirituality is on the rise in America, which means that articles like How to Feel Small are also on the rise as spiritual practices get stripped of religious undertones and peddled to the intrigued masses. So when I come across articles like this one, I do find some hope that these people who are intrigued by spirituality will eventually make their way to sanctuaries like this one in organized religion, where these spiritual practices have been put to work for thousands of years. Psalm 104 is the original How to Feel Small article. The psalmist literally stares out at oceans and looks up at stars recounting God's grand act of creation. And as if that's not enough to remind us of how puny we are, the psalmist has no qualms about going on with the whole list of creation long before ever getting to humans. We're not the center of this psalm. We're not the center of the creation story. And when humans do show up in the psalmist's account, we're not given any more honor or dignity than the creeping things or the birds of the skies. It's humbling, really. We are just one among many of God's good creations. I think the psalmist is getting to the heart of what happens when we feel small. Something happens when we stare out at nature and feel this sense of awe, recognizing just how vast the world is, how boundless creation is. I imagine that's part of why so many people say that being in nature satisfies their need for divine connection in this spiritual but not religious era we find ourselves in. Now, I do not believe that being in nature can replace what we do here on Sunday mornings, but I do think that being in nature and paying attention to creation is a necessity to understanding why we do what we do here. And so does the psalmist. In fact, I think this psalm is making a case for why we should go drink in God's creation on Sunday morning and then come straight to church because we can't help but worship and give thanks after we've paid attention to God's creation. Now this psalm in all 34, voices, 34 verses outlines what God has created, saying it all points back to God. Everything we can see and touch and taste ultimately should direct our attention to the one who made it all, and that is reason enough to praise the Lord. It's all God's handiwork. 
We'd be, ri- we'd be wise to remember that. But I think as the psalmist recounts all that God created, he makes an even more profound point. Because as he paints this picture of creation, he subtly keeps coming back to this one detail. Joy. Creatures exist for one another with joyful interdependence, he tells us. And God has created sources of joy for us. He created wine to gladden the human heart, oil to make the face shine, and bread to strengthen the heart. Joy. Even Leviathan, the wretched sea monster, God made for sport, the psalmist says. Even the scariest, most chaotic parts of creation have joy to be found in them, Because scary as sea monsters may be to us, Leviathan is nothing more than God's rubber ducky, according to the psalmist. This is what happens when we feel small. When the psalmist steps back and makes himself small, he not only appreciates that God created this earth and all that is in it, but he also appreciates that deeper wisdom that God didn't simply make creatures to survive. God made us and all other creatures to enjoy life. When he takes time to stare out on creation, he can't help but recognize that this world started with joy and exists for joy. Joy is at the very foundation of the earth, the psalmist reminds us, which means that joy is at the very foundation of our being, too. It's so easy to lose sight of that when we go about our days thinking we're in charge of our corner of the universe, and that must be all there is to it. And that's exactly why we need to heed the psalmist's word and follow the psalmist's example and make ourselves to feel small. Because when we do that, we'll remember that God didn't create us simply to survive, God didn't create us to live lives of joyless toil. God created us from joy and for joy. Now, joy has been at the center of Jewish and Christian life for millennia, but we don't pay much mind to joy. In fact, rarely do we associate joy with religion at all. As one preacher puts it, we tend to think that joy is not only not properly religious, but that it is even the opposite of religion. We tend to think that religion is sitting stiff and antiseptic and a little bored and that joy is laughter and freedom and reaching out our arms to embrace the whole wide preposterous earth which is so beautiful that sometimes it nearly breaks our hearts. But this psalm says otherwise because the psalmist knows otherwise. It's all joy. God took joy in creating this world, the heavens and the seas and the mountains, the birds and the creeping things, and you, God made us for joy. Survival has never been the end game. God started with joy, and joy is the end game for you and for me. We were made to be joyful people, to experience joy, to appreciate joy in creation, to share our joy with others. When was the last time that you felt joy? Not happiness. Happiness is man-made. A happy home, a happy marriage, a happy relationship with our friends. We work for these things, and if we're careful and wise and lucky, we can usually achieve them. But when was the last time that you felt the unspeakable joy of being alive? The miracle of being just who you are with the blue sky and the green grass, the faces of your friends and the waves of the ocean being just what they are, the joy of release, of being suddenly well when you had been sick, of being forgiven when before you were ashamed and afraid, of finding yourself loved when you were lost and alone. When was the last time you felt joy like that? Because to know joy is to know something about what it must have been like when God stretched out the heavens like a tent and made the clouds a chariot. Creation was an act of joy. 
And God designed this world so that joy might always flow through our lives. It seems so simple, joy. But I wonder what would happen if we took the psalmist's words to heart. Would anything of your life change if you began each day remembering that God created you from joy and for joy? Would your priorities change if you set out each day not simply to survive the day, but to enjoy the day? That is God's wish for us in creation, because creation begins with joy. You were made from joy and for joy. That is what the psalmist wants us to know about God's good work of creation. It's all joy. So then let us rejoice and praise the Lord together.